Welcome to the Stories or Soul Food podcast with your hosts, Brian Cole and best selling author, N.D. Wilson. This audio is brought to you by Cannonball Books and Great Homeschool Conventions. Great Homeschool Conventions are the homeschooling events of the year, offering outstanding speakers, hundreds of workshops on today's top parenting and homeschooling topics and the largest homeschool curriculum exhibit halls in the United States of America. We believe passionately in the God-given right and responsibility of parents to train and educate their children. Today, we're talking, we're changing things up a little bit to talk about some- some inhuman characters. We're specifically talking about one story that's become very famous. Just one? We have to talk about just the one? No, we can talk about many. It'll, okay. it'll go wider. But okay. I, I, I wanted to start the conversation with some non-human characters. Okay. So, that's what this episode could be called. It also could be called Toy Story because I didn't want to talk about it. Story. <laughs> we can call it non-human characters. We can call it subhuman characters. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. Shots fired. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Yeah. Word, word play. No insult intended. Oh, okay. Good. I thought to myself, Nate writes lots of really good human characters. And I had in my mind that you might have written a short story with some inhuman characters. Hmm. But, uh, um, but then I, I was just going to ask you, have you written non-human main characters? Not main characters, no. At least not off the top of my head. Possibly in a short story sometime that I'm currently not remembering. Yeah. But, you know, peripheral characters. Mm -hmm. But main characters, non-human main characters has not been my jam. Although I will say they're happening more and more. There's a long tradition of children's fiction with non-human characters and it's picking up. It's not reducing. Yeah. And it's especially picking up in... um, among more conservative writers Hmm. because it enables you to sort of dodge a lot of the, uh, you know, issues of sensitivity and, you know, some of the cultural hot button issues. I've actually heard, I've heard of conversations in secular publishing where they are encouraging white writers to simply write with talking animals. Like that's like, that's your move now. So identity politics means that you can't write about what you are. No, you can't. I mean, so if we're, and this isn't the point of this episode, but right. if we're saying you, you're not going to have a mainstream hit on the New York Times list right now, that's a white author writing about white characters. You want diverse casts, but we live in a moment when white authors are not allowed or permitted to work with diverse characters. Right. So, which is unfortunate because you want that. And then, so now- We now, want authors to be one, one arm tied behind their back. Yeah. We'd rather, we'd rather authors be able to write broad- sympathetic and empathetic uh, perspectives, not necessarily just their own and only their own. But anyway, that's kind of, that's kind of an aside. That's just why we're seeing more uh, an uptick in manuscripts that are yeah. talking animals. Yeah. And, and I mean- Or toys. <laughs> <laughs> stories per about chance. Them. Stories about toys. Yes. <laughs> I think that's kind of where it starts. What does it change? Does it actually, does it change when you move from the human realm to an animal or a toy? It does. It, it changes a lot. And one of the biggest upsides, like pros and cons, pros, you can write adult characters and adult psychologies for kids. Mm-hmm. And other, you can't do that otherwise. So oh, it's, Wait, wait, wait. Explain that for me. So, if I said, hey, I'm writing a novel for children. And it's about a 66-year-old man and a 57-year-old woman. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Okay. And everybody's like, what? Like, no, you can't do that. And I said, okay. And I switch it. I'm writing a story for children and it's about a 66-year-old beaver and a 57-year-old squirrel. All of a sudden, we're like, oh, that's that's fantastic. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Rat and mole and badger living in a mansion. Exactly. So, we got, I mean, you think back to all the... There, I mean, there's a grand tradition of yeah, non-human if you wrote, children's If you, if you wrote stories. a story about a toad that, or a human that had serious troubles wrecking cars and yeah, all exactly. kinds of stuff, you got great Gatsby. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, suddenly it's not for the children. Yeah. It's F. Scott Fitzgerald commenting yeah. on his times. 
So we we take Wind in the Willows and every, everything else that's the secret of Nim, you know. Yeah. And you get to write with adult characters and you get to write with adult themes, adult perspectives, adult fears. And in facing those adult fears, you have miniaturized them and reduced them in a way that will help children comprehend them and relate to them. So it's a way of recasting adult struggles. And as we see in the Toy Story franchise and in Watership Down and mm -hmm. in many, many other stories with animal characters or non-human characters, you can tackle very large existential issues. Yeah. So the futility of life, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the inevitability of mortality in the case of Toy Story. Yeah. Being discarded, being thrown away, no yeah. longer being needed. Wanting to be accepted for what you... That's yeah. What, yeah, friendship. And to be completely honest, if we're talking about the, the movies, and they are they have some strong moments some very strong things about them they are ultimately sort of the the work product of people in midlife realizing their own irrelevance in the lives of their children and afraid of dying oh, that's wow that's what those stories are those stories are grown men and women working through to okay. greater greater and lesser degrees of success the issues of the book of ecclesiastes I mean, that's what's going on in Toy Story. <laughs> I think we have to unpack that a bit. I, lo I love it. I'm, I'm with it here. Pix okay, Pixar's first feature, right? First, yeah. com first computer animated film. This is what kind of what launched them on, on their success. And, and yeah. This is what made George Lucas look really stupid. Okay. Because he, he had invested and then he divested. Oh. And Steve Jobs got to be a rock star one more time. And you can say, how did Steve Jobs end up in a massive shareholder position in Disney? And it's because he bought out George Lucas in this little, this little tech company that, uh, that Lucas had invested in. Working in computer um, animation. Yeah, I've, I've heard also that Jobs had successfully bought out every single one of the founding members of Pixar by the time Toy Story released as well. So anyway, that's a, that's a totally different <laughs> story. Lessons for a different <laughs> podcast on business. <laughs> um, business and the arts. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah because that was like a, a 30 million dollar investment with a 400 oh, they were million deep dollar. They, they were deep much deeper in it okay so that's just the numbers on the service but the 400 million dollar the, the thing that was enormous much bigger than that was the acquisition by disney of pixar and that came with a board seat and disney shares and lots of things like that which jobs received anyway that, yeah okay but to the story at the outset it's not about it's not about futility yet. You know, in the, in the first movie, we have issues of destruction. We have Sid. A great character. You know, we're a great character. We have cruelty to toys. We have popularity. Yeah, the tension between. Yeah, issues of being Buzz loved, making a new friend, learning how to make new friends, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. And then just the joy of watching toys be alive. Yeah, and a, so, commu a community of toys is a pretty fun. Yeah, it gives you a, there's a ton of potential, and it also taps into wish fulfillment in a major way. And so, oh yeah, that's big. The wish fulfillment for kids to think of their toys as living and having lives apart from them when they're out of the room is yeah, uh, is pretty fun, especially when those toys are consumed with love for that child <laughs> when that <laughs> when that child is out of the room. But they um, only think about you yeah. and want you to come play with them. <laughs> yeah. So Toy Story 1 was, you know, really great and basic, but it also focused in on human, like adult human issues. Yeah. That it then relates to children because it's happening through this cowboy toy or this space toy. And it's, you know, they're not unique to adulthood, but they're definitely themes that are not unique to childhood either. Yeah. Well, the fundamental backdrop of it is that idea of growing up, yep. which, which is not how children think about themselves. At yeah. least I don't think. No. And the toys, kids actually, I will say obsess about growing up. Yeah. But okay. not, not in a, not, not the way that, not in an accurate way. Right. <laughs> they obsess about growing up just in the idea of being bigger i'm big enough right I'm to the, do this yeah yeah getting meaning like you're constantly getting tall enough for the next ride as yeah, a child right as opposed to that sense it, it does feel like toy story has from the beginning that idea of loss accompanied, yep. with, <laughs> accompanied with aging <laughs> yeah look at andy written on the bottom of your boot yeah and can a kid relate to that that's that's the adult right there right you know which is why toy story was so successful oh, well, the merch and, is so good too because yep. the adults yeah. But it crossed, it crossed demographics and was a huge four-quadrant hit, obviously, and built the brand.
But if we look at the lessons of why tell stories or why read your kids' stories or watch stories with non-human characters, it is because there can be themes that can be explored and addressed differently because your main characters are suddenly adults in costumes. There you go. So adults in a spaceman suit or adults as a bunny rabbit, adults Mm -hmm. as a toad. Right. Instead of just an adult. So you write a Woodhouse novel and it's for grownups. You make all those characters animals and it's for kids. Mm. You know, and and basically the same stuff could happen. (laughs) You know, it's like it's (laughs) So, The Code of the Woosters, rewritten with rodents, is a children's novel. Is Wind in the Willows of some sort. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think, yeah. And who knows? The, re- the real question is uh, who the Empress of Blandings is, the pig, mm. the giant pig. How do you then turn the pig into something else? Does the pig become human? <laughs> <laughs> no. Now it's a Orwellian story or something. Anyway, so when you tackle stories or you read your kids' stories, or let them read or watch stories with non-human characters, you are fundamentally allowing them to look at life through an adult lens, but it's an adult lens in costume. See, this is why I have you on here because I, I got that totally backwards when I was thinking <laughs> about this. I was thinking it seems like that doesn't change much between the characters. You know, you still, have, yeah. you still have the same sorts of emotions. You've just put them in a different body shape. But I see now you, it is really about what you're allowed to talk about. It is. Yes. What you're allowed to talk about, what you're allowed to address. And then one, and then a major thing, an additional thing is the fact that it enables you to have an adventure without actual grownups. So yeah, you have, um, I think you've talked about that before, like CS Lewis during the yeah. war. Yeah. Yeah. So you, ha- you get rid of grownups because either you are in a rolled doll situation where adults are all evil and you read a lot of his books and you have awful parents or guardians. We see this with Harry Potter also, where it's, you know, it's like the Dursleys are just the worst. Yeah. Uh, the grown up guardians in Harry's life are just abominable. To be avoided and worked yeah. around at every chance. So then you, you watch Toy Story, you look at that kind of, you diagnose that story and you think, okay, so this, this is a story about grownups who are subordinate to a child and who are having their own adventure. <laughs> you know, but they're miniature and they're toys. And they're toys. So, and, it's, so it's not weird. And it's, and it's funny and it's funny and it's great and we love it, but it, it, it enables you to have them take off and jump out the windows and venture out and, and push their own limits, which are arbitrary because they're the limits of toys, not the limits of adults or children, mm-hmm. but they're all grown ups with grown up psychology and conversation yeah. and verbal skills and everything else. It's all very grown up. We have characters right. who are married with the potato heads. We have, yeah you know, Bo Peep and Woody, we've got right. this uh, two macho men resenting each other uh, <laughs> along with the delusion of Buzz. There's so many different pieces that are going on. Plastic soldiers. Yeah, the plastic soldiers, the Dotson, you know, the, the Rexy, everything's great. I love the story, the first one and the second one especially, but um, it's all great, but it removes mature grown-ups with driver's licenses who could just solve the problem. Mm from the picture, but gives you mature grown up verbal skills and intellect and, you know, emotional baggage and then lets kids process it all. Some depth and some thematic difference. Yeah. So it it gives you all those things, but in, in every kind of kid's story, you're looking very quickly for how to get rid of the grown ups with driver's licenses who could solve the problem. Right. Uh, Because otherwise it's their adventure. So. Mm. If you have a great relationship with your dad and you're 12 and you're going to have an adventure, but you have a great relationship with your dad and he's in your life. <laughs> and your baby sister is abducted yeah. and you have to go rescue her. You, you don't know. go do that. You yeah. know, you, the first thing you do is go to dad and right. say, dad, the green men came through the window and took away the baby sister. Yeah. You know, like it's how do you make the adventure of the child's? And when you move into rabbits, when you move into cats or dogs or toys mice. or yeah, birds, mice, any number of things, it can give you an adult that the kids can follow and relate to and aspire to who doesn't have the driver's license, you know, like they have, mm. they have limitations of their own. It also can give you, uh, you, can, you could go write about a young rabbit, an adolescent rabbit, a young mouse, and it enables you to 
shift familial structures and obligations and life cycles and things in such a way that it it makes total sense that that rabbit sets out to have that adventure yeah. without just going to dad, you know. Yeah, cuz I guess the earliest animal stories would be would be fables, right? Yeah. And that and uh are they doing something similar? I'm thinking like the Aesop's ones. You know, there's ways in which they are. They're doing something similar where they're taking something adult, you know, usually an adult theme, a cautionary tale or just a yeah. joke. Yeah, with the wolf and the lamb, you're getting yeah. to see some themes of injustice in a way that well, it becomes clear when you yeah. when you see people who take advantage of the the lambs as wolves. Yeah. And that's I guess that's And then later you have uh you have Gesso stories and Right. You know, there's there's a lot yeah. of there's a lot of uh variations on Did you re- did you read any of those public domain Thornton Wilder Thornton Burgess? The, they're the animal stories about like Johnny the Woodchuck and they're pretty, they're pretty bad stuff. <laughs> no, but, I've seen uh, them, but no. Oh, okay. Never, never got into them. I did read a ton of Jungle Doctor. Oh, me too. So much Jungle Doctor. That I highly, I've been trying to find that for the kids. I need to. Yeah. So, <laughs> and then when you have little, little stories that are functionally like little parables about, you know, mm-hmm. monkeys trying to pull nuts out of jars or whatever. Yeah. Cross the river. Yeah, exactly. Without getting eaten. So, it's, they're, they're great. But um, if you did that with kids, Ooh, uh, it, they don't always end well. <laughs> yeah. So here are two children and they're going to cross the river without getting eaten. We'll see which one succeeds, Bob. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know? and from that, we'll draw an obvious moral lesson for the rest of your life. Obey right. your parents. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. So the whole point is any kind of sleight of hand, any kind of like one motion to the walnut shell, moving the sympathy and loyalty of the reader, of the listener uh, or the viewer. In, mm-hmm. into a non-adult adult or a or a kid but a kid without the social structures of right. human society so it also is another way of bypassing yeah you know the same issues and it reduces the stakes it reduces the stakes of destruction it reduces the stakes of of yeah. death and and so on you said earlier this whole, the whole goal is for the child to make the story their own yeah. And uh, to own I, it. I guess if it is an adult world, there is that sense in which it's not, it's not theirs. But yeah. if you change it. But the, it's not just not theirs. They have no interest. They're not going to, they're not going to read it. They're not going to watch it. They don't want to be there. It's not the food for them. Yet. Yeah. So it's, you know, there's, it feels completely wrong. This metaphor might jump the shark, but it's like giving your kid rum cake, uh, but not rum. <laughs> you know, it's, Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, it's sort of like, okay, kid, here's a flavor that yeah. is from something that you don't get and should not get and that you won't process, but it's Christmas. So here's your piece of rum cake. And and the kids never got that flavor anywhere else. Yeah. And they can love it. They can love the rum cake, but you're not you're not giving them the rum. You know, that's just I think that's kind of the way it works. Hmm. So I'll take this flavor this theme this thing that is heavy and adult and i will make it fluffy and fun and childish mm. and it's still recognizably of that flavor so okay wow okay yeah that makes sense because i'm thinking now working my way through all children's stories watership down deals with some extremely dark things yep and some weird like socio-political right stuff and society and it's just, religious yeah, yeah. yeah. uh you know what children you're allowed to have, who's allowed to be married to who, you know, stuff yeah. that you could never talk, uh, that would be in a Margaret Atwood story if it ever made it into uh, sure <laughs> the, the mainstream. The Handmaid's <laughs> Rabbits. Yeah. <laughs> I would read, I would read that book. I've not read The Handmaid's Tale, but would, <laughs> the, yeah. Yeah. I haven't read it, nor will I. And yeah. Put it in an animal world. Maybe you got me. <laughs> yeah. Put it in a rum cake and I'll <laughs> think about it. Yeah. Trick me. Trick me into reading The Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> Yeah, it'll take a trick for sure. Yeah. So I think that, yeah, Watership Down does that. Secret of Nim. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're talking about, uh, there's a glimpse there into human society because we're, we're talking about being experimented upon. Right. You know, rats. And it granting you marvelous power. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Things, things like The Borrowers. Did you ever read The Borrowers? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I love The Borrowers. Me like, too. It, it what a just, cool idea. Little people in your walls. Yeah. It just lit up my imagination. Um, so, yeah. it's humanoid, but definitely not human. Right. And even the adult characters are totally relatable for a young kid. Right. For that, for that reason. Man, the scene of them fighting the rats <laughs> in the walls. <laughs> 
That's just, that's scarier than anything when yep. you're when you're eight. And then uh, and what Stuart Little too? Yeah, <laughs> Stuart, Stuart Little, the man. I wanted that motorcycle. Oh, so cool! The ship when they get stuck in the bag on the pond in the storm, <laughs> and, and they're trying to cut his way out of a bag. Yeah. That's real as real as any Robinson Crusoe storm. And of me. course, we have things like Tale of Despero, and there's I mean, there's just yeah. there's newer ones and older ones, and they can be they can be very heavy. I mean, they can yeah. have rum they can have the heavy adult themes it's just now in a cake i think that's a helpful way of explaining it because we have Stuart little in some of our curriculum and people always complain about it <laughs> they complain about why does the human family have a mouse child that's what they complain about and don't you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no i accept it <laughs> no i mean don't you have a mouse child oh yeah exactly. <laughs> doesn't every right every family have a mouse child i'm gonna i'm gonna ask them that i think they're just missing the point obviously right not really it doesn't take that yes, much suspend the disbelief if you don't the story doesn't work <laughs> why do they have a mouse child and why would they think to give him a ping pong motorcycle helmet a ping pong ball yeah it's it's pretty funny yeah so there and there's a, a broad spectrum where that's basically farcical but still tackles big issues yeah and then watership down is the example that we'll come back to a lot where it tackles like legitimately heavy yeah heavy social issues yeah. And I think does so brilliantly. And they're actually, they're working on a, a friend of mine is working on a graphic novel of Watership Down right now. Mm. Yeah. Joe Sutphin mm. is involved and I think it's going to be amazing. I think he's, I think he's perfect for the it. The art looks great. But so it's, um, I'm really curious how it comes across, you know, yeah. what the, the impact, like whether it will impact young readers in the same way that the actual prose does. Because I know exactly what, a, what Watership Down does to a fifth grader. I don't know what pictures of yeah pictures of watership down did you watch the netflix version of it i can tell you that i started it yeah it and didn't, i it didn't just work. wasn't it didn't just, work. just was not drawn in so wait i think i don't we didn't finish it but we didn't make it a couple in i think it might have just been animation issues for me but i yeah possibly yeah but uh, that's that, that a question that could have contributed we'll look forward to to checking it out so i mean you, you bounce through and we we started off with pixar and you say okay toy story toy story 2 we do the same thing what's going on in finding nemo it's like well we have obvious like significant adult themes here mm -hmm. and it's not an accident that we spend most of our time uh in the Wait. a in the a story with the dad yeah so the a story there is marlin trying to find his son mm -hmm. his son is in a, a funny little comical setting. Right. It's, it's the fun and game section yeah. of the script. Yeah. is know? He's in the funny dentist office meeting right. the funny characters. You're yelling bubbles or, yeah, you know, it's like swim through the the, the bubbles of Mount Wanahakalugi. <laughs> uh, shark bait, ooh ha ha. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of great stuff in there, but we're following Darla. the, we're, yeah, we're, <laughs> Darla. <laughs> we are following the dad. Yeah. But he's not a dad. He is a dad. These are dad themes. This is the rum and the rum cake. Yeah. Except for no child looks at him and thinks, that's a grown man who is a father <laughs> because it's a useless clownfish struggling to make sense of Dory. And he can't tell jokes. Yeah. Yes. He's not funny. And we, you, you look at that and you bounce around, you look at which ones worked and which ones didn't work. You have cars that didn't work uh, as a story, but worked massively as a merchandise commercial. Mm. So cars might have made more money yeah. than almost any of them at this point, and is one of the is that is that true? Yep, and is it one just of isn't the as uh, good a movie. No, it's not, but it yeah. it, it you know kids love it because it's fun because it's got eyes yeah. eyes, on the, eyes on the cars. <laughs> yeah, and you but if you bounce through these and you you think about which ones were strong and which ones were weak, yeah. and up is weak and inside out is weak, mm -hmm. uh, but you go backward. And you look at the things they did early, mm. you know, Monsters Incorporated. Okay. Yeah. Is this about Boo? No. This, the whole movie is not about the kid. Yeah. It's about two grown men. Yeah. But they're in costume. Right. And it's also two grown men in a corporate contest. <laughs> like they're, they're, the, the, the test, the pressure is all how well they perform at work and, you know, rivalries yeah. and so on. It's hilarious. They don't, it's just adult, but it's paperwork. A, but it's yeah. adult with brilliant animated fur mm -hmm. <laughs> and voice talent and humor and everything else. Yeah. Same thing with Ice Age. Same thing with any number of DreamWorks or Blue Sky or Pixar productions. The ones that work 
are adult themes, adult characters, mm -hmm. but laughable enough and funny enough and relatable enough that the kids are in. So a good story. Yeah, a good story, but it is full circle. I have not written, I've written plenty of like film treatments, script concepts, things like that for characters that are non-human. But uh, one of my favorites is of a family of the seven deadly sins, but it's... <laughs> Can you say more about that? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I will. But it's a. Uh, but I think the the thing that really works is when you don't try to tackle childhood themes in animation, and when movies oh, okay, tackle okay. childhood themes in non-human characters or in animated stories, you kind of kind of lose it. So even in in things that are you know they're not Pixar quality, but things like Despicable Me. It's Gru. It's the adult character that makes it, you know, and is there, and of course the minions, the non-human right. minion characters. And that's what sucks in the kids, not the kids. Uh, and then you look at movies like Meet the Robinsons and you're kind of like, why did this not go? Is it because it's, it's about the kid? It's just about the kid. Hmm. So it's about the, it's about kid issues for kids. And instead of repackaging something that would be inaccessible otherwise, Oh man, I'm going to kill myself thinking about this. Now. It's, the, it's, it's the thing that's within reach already that you, you, uh, you know, you did a massive amount of work to repackage something that they already understand and can handle. Okay. Yeah. So meet the Robinsons. Which is should, fun. Which, yeah. Which uh, yeah, has its fun moments. You're, you're saying it should have been, you know, if we're really going to mess with it, it needed to be at about an adult character or a non-human character, adult, adult themes, as opposed to a kid theme of like trying to make friends and trying to yeah, be adopted, trying to belong trying to be yep. adopted as an orphan which is mm -hmm. something we get from a kid automatically yep and has also been done so yeah it's not that there's anything wrong with that it's yeah. just that it's it's been done and i happen to really like writing kid characters yeah tackling kid themes but in a context where the world is going nuts yeah. so like the the themes are basic the emotional stressors are understandable and within reach but the chaos of the universe is enormous yeah which is just the, the classic fairy, fairy tale structure but if we're talking if i was going to write a story about mice rabbits frogs toys mm -hmm. if i was going to go non-human then i would age it up immediately for my non-human character mm -hmm. but the deadlies was a pitch about the seven deadly sins each of the sins is personified in this family and the very obese 14 year old boy sloth who is not even allowed to play video games because it's too engaging <laughs> <laughs> starts he reaches the age of rebellion and he starts sneaking out at night and he gets a paper route and he starts being secretly super diligent and rebelling against the vices of his family and losing weight his parents are deeply concerned <laughs> and trying to pin him down anyway yeah that was a uh, that was a p one pitch that makes me happy. Yeah. And, and really, it as was, it think of it as a version of uh, West Side Story. So, there's the deadlies and the virtues. Okay. And so, there's the, you know, dance off battles and all sorts of things between uh, the followers of the deadlies versus the virtues. We'll stay tuned for that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's not going to happen. It'll yeah. never, it'll never happen. <laughs> I sold the treatment, but, uh, you know, that's as far as it went. Well, what can we say? So, hey, yeah, DreamWorks kept the lights on for a minute with that project. But, uh, but yeah, it didn't go anywhere after that. Well, there we go. There's heaven. There's always heaven. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I, I will have moved on. But I do, I do think that there's, there's some brilliant stories out there that are non-human. There's amazing tradition of storytelling for kids and four-quadrant storytelling for kids in prose and film. You know, and obviously in film, it's mostly animation. And it's, it's just great. I mean, like there's a reason why it's great. And so you think like, okay, 101 Dalmatians. Yeah. Where are all the kids? Like, what's the, where are the captured and far away? Yeah. Most, for most of it, right? Yeah. And if yeah. you, and okay, there's puppies. Yeah. They're the kids. Right. And we're not following them. Yeah. So then you have uh, like the rescuers. Yeah. Uh, rescuers, rescuers down under. There are kids. But in as much as the kids are front and center. Yeah. Uh, the movies struggle. Right. You know, yeah. No. The it's mice about who are Bianca and Bernard. Yeah. The mice yeah. who are members of a secret rescuing society is far more interesting uh, and yes. exciting than yeah. just a kid who's stuck. So, anyway, I think all the way through, if you're going to pick a book 
to read your kids or a movie to watch with your kids that's non-human be aware like look for what the flavor is like what is the adult flavor here that they're going to get where are the conversations what's the dialogue going to be like afterward mm -hmm. and if it's just childishness so yeah it, it could just be without all that extra effort it, it could just exist without any of the animalian features or the toy features then what's the point right yeah no we were just talking about we you know lion king for good and ill mm. with repackaging hamlet into yeah. lions you know dealing with some pretty intense themes yeah. there yep um but doing it in a way that your kids watch and well i don't know maybe we need to have conversations about their uncles now <laughs> <laughs> never trust your uncles don't trust your uncle <laughs> yeah well, i think that's the theme of hamlet right yeah that's yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Never. They didn't quite push it all the way. They didn't go. They didn't go to the insanity. They know? didn't. They didn't go full Hamlet. Yeah. They didn't go with insanity. We don't have the Ophelia character. We don't have. Uh, well, Ophelia just ends up supporting him. N Nala <laughs> becomes the support of Ophelia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, there should have been a Dogberry for sure. Oh man, the, the missed opportunities. But hey, it still worked. We can't really say that it failed. I mean, they did have Polonius though. So yeah, the, the bird whatever his name yeah. is, Zazu. Yeah, they did. And they, of course, have a warthog. So, that, that's kind of like Dogberry. Yeah, that makes up a lot. So, yeah, the, the non-human, especially for the younger kids, non-human storytelling is a, gr a fantastic gateway into interactions with adult themes and adult characters in a safe and contained, relatable way that enables dialogue after the fact that kids can understand. There it is. That's a long theme statement, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll work it. I'll distill it between now and the next time. Perfect. The end. The end? We're done? Okay. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Stories or Soul Food podcast. Before we let you go, I wanted to make sure all of you Hello Ninja fans knew that for any ninja in your life, you can get them the Hello Ninja coloring book. Head to canonpress.com and find the coloring book today.